Hey everybody, this is Greg Pettix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Pettixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Fever Dreams, published in 1972 from Kitchen Sink Enterprises. Uh, it's a team-up comic, two stories, one by John Atkins Richardson and uh, one by Richard Corbin, who also does this beautiful cover. Um, this is uh, illustrates the story from inside but it's a little more uh, a fantastical take on it. But uh, just soak that into your eyeballs. That's some nice stuff. Um, this is one of the first undergrounds I ever bought as a kid. I got it from Bud Plant. And, uh, you know, I liked Corbin from getting some slow deaths. So I was getting anything I could by Corbin. Because I was too young to get, like, R. Crumb type undergrounds. So I liked the, you know, the fantasy sci-fi undergrounds. Like slow death and comics like this. Beautiful inside front cover by uh, Richard Corbin. You may not care to behold this ancient matron's visage, but think back a while to her younger days when she was beautiful. A very wistful, melancholy piece by Corbin. Um, the first story is by John Atkins Richardson, the art, but it's written by Jan Sternod, who uh, wrote many great underground comics, a lot of them for Richard Corbin. Um, I don't know if he's ever teamed up with uh, John before, John Richardson. But uh, he was an academic, John Atkins Richardson. He uh, taught at a college. He did uh, a lot of fanzine work. And uh, from what I read on the internet, it makes it sound like he was the impetus for this project. Um, I think he wanted to make a real underground. And luckily he got Richard Corbin to uh, team up with him because... Probably no one would remember this or want this comic without the Corbin part of it. But um, the Unicorn Quest, it's a kind of, you know, barbarian fantasy type comic. And uh, we see this guy, Ian, and his little friend, Mona. She's like a little monkey lady because she has like tits, <laughs> but she's got a little monkey face. So she's this weird little creature, but she seems like it's uh, she's a very good friend to Ian. Um, Ian goes to this witch. He uh, wants a steed that uh, can match that of Prince Jude of Nebrock. I guess he hates this guy and he wants to show him up. So the witch shows him a vision of this unicorn that he could catch. And um, the witch says, you know, here's the map. Be careful, though. Things may not be what they seem. And uh, as the story progresses, we kind of realize that Ian's kind of a, a douchebag. You know, we think he's the heroic hero of this, you know, like in a fantasy comic, but we'll see that he's kind of a jerk. Uh, Mona keeps giving him good advice, and he's always just saying, shut up. So this hot woman shows up. She says, hey, could I get a lift? And Mona's like, remember what the witch said? I don't know about this, but he's like, nah, this lady's hot. So, of course, Mona's right, because pretty soon we can see the the woman's turning into this Basil Wolverton-esque monster that tries to kill Ian, but it knocks him from his horse and the uh, demon flies away. For some reason, doesn't press the issue and try to kill him. So he finds this horse, because uh, the horse ran away, and he goes to this little town. He's got a um, shot his horse. Uh, he's missing a horseshoe now. Some really nice art of this city here. John Atkins Richardson was pretty good. Um, he uh, he was also important to me because in 1977 he published this uh, book called The Complete Book of Cartooning. And when I was a 10-year-old kid, that thing was my Bible. I re read that over and over. It had beautiful art from all these great comic artists. That's maybe where I first saw Richard Corbin's art. It showed some of his art and other cartoonists. But, um, you know, I thought I wanted to be a cartoonist. I just had no skill. So I tried to do some of the lessons in his book. And practice, but I realized quickly that I sucked, and I was also too lazy to get better. So in this city, um, these roughing up people, just like all these people are, just like you know, get the fuck out of here, and um, they don't seem to like him. And uh, I think maybe they know that he's after the unicorn, and they don't want him to. He goes to this blacksmith. The blacksmith is like, we're closed. So he totally threatens to blind him with this hot poker. And 
the hunchback blacksmith says, fine, I'll do it. So he's, uh, his horse is shod, and now they're back on their quest. And then in the middle of the night, um, they get attacked by these uh, bird-like demons. And here's the, kind of a harpy. And uh, Ian kills them. And uh, all the birds fall when the harpy falls. And then, the, but then when he looks over, he he's actually like saying, finally, he's like, you know, I think you're right, Mona. Maybe we should just go home. But then he realizes that Mona was killed in the attack. Poor little Mona, little sweet monkey girl. And so now it kind of reinvigorates him. He's like, fuck this then. Now I'm definitely not leaving without my prize. I'm going to get that fucking unicorn. He looks over and he sees that the heartbeat is turned back into that woman who he was going to give a ride or who he did give a ride to earlier. And uh, all the little bird demons are just normal little birds now. So uh, he buries Mona and um, he's even a dick to his horse. He's kind of berating his horse not for running fast enough. So he finally corners this unicorn in like a gulch or something on the edge of a cliff. And all of a sudden the hunchback shows up. And uh, Ian's, a, you know, he's an asshole. He's like, what are you going to do? You know, wound me in the knee because he's so small. And all of a sudden, the hunchback's back rips open and these wings come out. And uh, she's totally, uh, she's giving Ian the what for. But then Ian gets the upper hand and stabs him. Then the unicorn turns into this, like, kind of gross creature. And kills uh, Ian and we can see him chomping on him he's just eating him it turns out the hunchback is not dead I guess it was only a flesh wound and the unicorn turns back into a unicorn uh, they walk out of this cave together I really like this panel just the way he's looking up at the sun I don't know it just it's unnecessary but it's really nice and then they're happily walking back to the town after, you know, getting rid of Ian. Yeah, I like kind of like this comic. It's, uh, Chance Tornad was definitely better than most uh, writers at the time. But um, I like how he can make a complex character like Ian. You know, most guys would have just made him like the typical Conan type dude. But you're definitely, he's a very unlikable guy. So this is the real reason why we're here. To meet the faces you meet by Stranad and Corbin. Love this cute little starship. He's kind of like a character in the book, uh, comic, as you'll see. Look at this, like, starscape Corbin lays down. That is, man, that guy never cut corners. He was just, just uh, such a real artist. He didn't have to draw that great. Everyone would have been totally happy if he did half the work on that, but he couldn't help himself. So inside the spaceship, we see this guy is getting laid, and uh, his robot buddy's like, who is the ship? Um, he's like, hey, we're getting attacked. Come on, cut it out. And uh, so he makes this thing disappear. It's actually a hologram. And he's kind of pissed off. But he's like, okay, I guess I got to. Yeah, his name's Frizz, by the way. So just, you know, just Corbin totally playing to his strengths. Well, big titties. And, um, but just look at this airbrush art. But he kind of jumps back and forth between airbrush and just line work in this comic. So, uh, these guys are going to attack him. This guy, turns out, Frizz is a psychic. So they've been eluding this, like, you know, empire for a long time, it sounds like. Because whenever they come close to him, he can make them see images. So, you know, he makes this, he makes the spaceship appear here, and they shoot it, but really, they're over there. He can do all kinds of things with his mind. And uh, the little spaceship guy kills the empire baddies bad guys who are trying to kill him. So, uh, you know, Frizz seems pretty bored. And he's like, you're not still sore about the girl, are you? And he's like, yeah, she bored me anyway. I want a real woman. You know, one that, you know, <laughs> might uh, argue with me and just not give in to my every whim. He's bored of it, of these hologram women. But then, one of the ship's uh, occupants escaped in her, like, life suit. And so the spaceship guy brings her in, and when he takes off her uniform, you know, he sees it's a woman, and when she wakes up, he, uh, 
he explains, you know, their whole situation. No, but I'm sorry, Mead is the name of the ship. So Mead and Frizz have been pals for a long time. And um, so she kind of tells them that, him that, like, hey, you know, before I left uh, Sirius, uh, the scuttlebutt, the word on the street is that they have a helmet now that can see through your illusions. So uh, you guys might be uh, not so golden anymore. So Frizz and Mead kind of decide to do one last score and then head out to deep space because um, the jig is up. Their, their little defense system won't work anymore. So, uh, Corbin gets really cartoony here. This is just like totally cartoony looking dudes, these generals or whatever. And so the little ship attacks. He makes himself invisible until the last second and uh, gets a bunch of supplies and stuff. But yeah, this is fun. You're, you're show, they're showing all the illusions that he's making. A giant dinosaur is attacking the guys, and they believe it. They're shooting at him. Um, there's an earthquake. They feel they all feel like they're falling in the cracks of the earth, while uh, Mead is stealing all their shit, pterodactyls, and then he flies off. I love this little character. I just wish he was in a hundred comics. I'd read every one. He's so freaking cute, Mead. So they fly off successfully. They uh, did their read. But then, once again, the Empire's there, and this time they got the guy with the helmet, the new helmet. So, he's basically telling these guys, you know, nope, don't fire at that thing, it's not even there. It's, I can see, it's an illusion. Or, I'm sorry, it's the opposite. I think there's, they see empty space. And he says, nope, fire, just trust me, fire. So, he makes a monster appear to fuck with the other guys in the ship who don't have helmets. So... This monster appears. This guy just, you know, can't even fire the button because he's wigging out. So this guy lunges, pushes him out of the way, hits the laser, and it wings Mead. There he is getting hit in, like, his shoulder part. But it's a pretty uh, powerful blow because they're, like, knocked off their feet. And then we see in the ship that he's making this another illusion where they're all attacking the guy in the helmet. And this is what they see. This is a great panel. Basically convinces them they're all cavemen fighting this, uh, I don't know, some Neolithic creature. And, uh, but this guy's still, you know, even though he's getting his ass kicked, he still reaches the laser for a second hit. And after he's hit, Mead sends off a missile and destroys them. But Mead's blacking out. He can't keep up the illusion, any illusion anymore. Because Mead would help him create his illusions. He would make up the illusions and Mead's power would like project them. So uh, the woman turns around and all of a sudden this is what Frizz looks like. Because this whole time Mead has been casting an illusion on Frizz, making him look handsome. But this is what he really looks like. So he says, tries to convince her, he says, you know, Mead will be up and running soon. He can bring the illusion back so, you know, you won't be grossed out by me. Everything could be hunky-dory. And, uh, but she's just like, no, fuck that. You're disgusting. She hits him on the head with a bottle. And, uh, she hits the escape pod, which kind of vomits out of Mead's mouth. And then, um, a little while later, they both wake up. Um, Mead's, uh, done with his fixing his, uh, ship himself. And, uh... He says, we barely made it this time. Next time they'll all have them, the helmets. What are we going to do? And uh, Mead just says, let's go somewhere. I love that last panel. The end. And uh, yeah, that's some great Corbin. And uh, usually Corbin's stuff isn't this thoughtful, you know, kind of, it's kind of like a thoughtful sci-fi story. Um, usually stuff has, you know, a lot more blood and gore and tits and violence. But it's nice to see Corbin, you know, stretch a little. He's like, come here, trash up for all these great kitchen sink comics. I mean, this was a great time. All these amazing comics coming out. Damn. So, and then we have this nice back cover by John Atkins Richardson uh, of the Unicorn. And uh, this makes me sad. Sometime when I was a teenager, I had ink on my fingers. And I, <laughs> this comic is no longer in pristine mint condition. But I remember that was in that complete book of cartooning book I had. Uh, John Atkins Richardson 
showed you how this became a color plate and all the colors added. So that was burning in my brain. By the time I bought this comic, I was like, I know that drawing. I've seen that a hundred times. So there it is once again, the cover. Some beautiful, gorgeous stuff. Uh, belongs in everyone's uh, underground comic collection. I hope you liked it. Uh, and I hope you can find a copy. Because uh, you should definitely own this. And I'll see you next time. Thanks.